League shakeup. The MLR has restructured its league for the 2024 season. We break down what teams went to what divisions and the impact it's going to have on the world of fantasy MLR. We also tell you what your Thanksgiving meal this week has to do with fantasy MLR positions. A Thanksgiving edition of the Fantasy Rucker Show starts right now. Where rugby and the world of fantasy sports collide. Welcome to the Fantasy Rucker Show. Bringing fantasy rugby to the masses. Talking all things rugby from the MLR to leagues around the world. We're on top of it. Headphones on, pads off. This is the Fantasy Rucker Show. Now, here are your hosts, Ryan Yee, Matt Yee, and Devin Vanderpool. What's up, everybody? This is episode number 87 of the Fantasy Ruckers Show. Thank you so much to our Fantasy Ruckers League members, our community members, and everyone else tagging along on this journey of trying to make Fantasy Rugby a reality in the MLR. I'm Ryan Yee. With me, as always, Matt Yee. And Matty, we got a special Thanksgiving episode uh, for uh, for all of our Very listeners deep. and viewers this week. Happy Thanksgiving uh, to everyone out there. Uh, a nice little holiday weekend. A kickstart to, I guess, the, the festivities well, moving forward. Right. Happy Thanksgiving to the American That's fans true. out Fair there. Enough. We do have to represent Canada, Ryan. Um, and that Thanksgiving was like a month ago. So, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, not yeah, Thanksgiving I, I for mean, them, but hey. I I always get uh, teased at work about the American Canadian Thanksgiving thing. Where hey, aren't you celebrating? Uh, weren't you supposed to be celebrating a month ago? Uh, but hey, we fully embrace here us now being down in the we states. Are, we yep. fully embrace the we American have, culture here. We have embraced the American harvest schedule, so <laughs> we are on the American Thanksgiving harvest, not the Canadian one. All right. Well, on this Thanksgiving episode, uh, we do have a busy one here. Again, lots mm-hmm. of news and notes to get through. We got a big trade to talk about and, and talk about also a league shakeup when it comes to the MLR. Uh, we, I was talking about this um, reformatting of Major League Rugby on the Glorious Rugby podcast when I appeared there uh, a couple weeks ago um, that there was rumors that this was going to happen, but Major League Mm -hmm. Rugby has made an official announcement. So we're going to break that down here about how that restructuring of the league is going to affect kind of competition for the 2024 season. It's going to be an interesting one. Yeah, it will. It will be an interesting one to talk about um, and how that will impact fantasy. We don't know. Uh, Not too sure, but we'll get to that. But I got to get some things out of the way, Ryan, before we get into the bulk of the MLR news. One, uh, we're moving up in the world in the super brood. Just letting <laughs> everybody know, top twenty percent in uh, in the U.S., top twenty percent globally. Uh, no big deal. It is what it is. We're killing it. Uh, I don't know. Stephen Lowen again just was looking for it to take a bunch of L's from me as usual. Um, and then the last thing, just before we move on, is uh, up the T Birds. Uh, good luck to the UBC Thunderbirds today in the uh, or well on the weekend today um, in the finals of the Canadian Rugby University Championship or whatever the heck they're calling it these days against the UVic Vikes. Um, Yeah, good luck to them. Hope to see them get the dub uh, as they always do. So yeah, by the time this episode released, we will know the final result, but we do know Maddie's uh, Maddie's uh, uh, connection there with UBC. So we'll see who comes out on top there with those two West Coast powerhouses. And again, Matt, your your fantasy confidence is riding on a high right now. Maybe not in the world of fantasy football. That's a whole different well, conversation. We don't need to talk about that. But when it comes to fantasy rugby, it seems like uh, you've been on a roll. Uh, took that butt whooping at the start of the creation of this thing, and now you've just really taken that to heart. You've won a championship. Yeah. You're winning in Super Bowl fantasy. <laughs> premiership uh you're 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 moving on doing bigger and better things Look, here i don't want to call myself a savant but uh <laughs> I, I mean i think you're an, supposed uh, to be i made, I made a nice show i made a nice little transfer on on uh just before the uh the week or the round started made him the captain andrew christie whatever got 40 points this week it is what it is it's no big deal it's just the intuition of a savant fantasy player all right, I'll so, make sure to update update that on your uh, your bio there for the fans. Yes, please. Page I put it on my sure. resume already. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> so you have a little bit more credibility. All right, let's, well, let's start getting into all the news and notes and, and everything that we need to talk about here when it comes to MLR and the world of fantasy MLR. But of course, like we say every single episode uh, before we get into it, if you aren't already, make sure you're giving us a follow at the Fantasy Ruckers. Uh, handles are up there above on the YouTube video, down below in the description mm-hmm. if you're listening on the podcast. Um, again, uh, we've been working hard, uh, me and Alistair 
Kirschpool, our website guru, have been working hard to try to get this out to the masses, get, get Fantasy MLR to everyone out there who wants to give it a go. And we're inching closer and closer as we get closer to the uh, 2024 season. And you'll want to be following us on socials to be first in the know when that does happen. That's not enough for you. Got a Discord community you can join. Uh, that description is down below as well. And also make sure you check out the fantasyruckers.com, which is where Fantasy MLR will be hosted in the future moving forward. Uh, so, yeah, a whole bunch of exciting stuff. You want to be in the know there, especially when we do make the inevitable announcement that everyone can try Fantasy MLR. We're super excited for it. Hopefully it becomes a possibility in the 2024 season because that's the goal, um, which mm -hmm. should be uh, exciting stuff. All right, let's let's get into it, Maddie. Got a whole bunch of news and notes, like I said, to talk about. Um, and before we get into the big league format restructure, uh, let's talk about some roster moves. It's been, again, another busy week when it comes to Major League Rugby. And we'll start off with a massive trade that has happened. And, and for me... It, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for one of the teams that is involved. But again, I guess we'll we'll break it down here and kind of talk it out on what this kind of means for the two teams that are involved. The Chicago Hounds are receiving scrum half Jason Higgins from the San Diego Legion in exchange for front row hooker Hugh Roach. And why this makes this trade so interesting and something that we broke into depth last episode is the departure of Richard Judd, who was the starting uh, scrum half for the San Diego Legion. We had talked last episode that Jason Higgins was going to possibly or, or probably be the, the person mm -hmm. that steps up in that starting role. He was that backup player last season. Um, he has seen starting time in the MLR. But before we can even kind of really get into the depth of that, Jason Higgins moving to uh, the Midwest and is going to Chicago. Uh, Matt, what do, what do you think of this trade? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I look at it a couple ways, you know, I, I can't believe that in the midst of all this, they lose their number one nine. They've worked with Jason Higgins in the past, like we said, and Jason Higgins has been a suitable nine for them. And, and now he's shipped off to Chicago where I think he's going to get a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. I can see him starting over Michael Baska. Um, so yeah, I, I think he's going to still get that great opportunity in Chicago, still going to be something to watch for fantasy wise. Um, and, you know, San Diego gets Hugh Roach, a, a front rower that they probably need after losing both Shiloh Klein and Simon Malolo. Um, when you think about it, you know, Hugh Roach has that athletic ability similar to Simon Malolo. Has just, we've seen spurts of it and just was never as consistent. Uh, and what obviously never had the season like Simon Malolo had. Um, but it's, it's an interesting one to me, the way that I look at this, and you know, that I say this with every trade that when somebody departs and they trade away a position that you think that they needed, that means there's something in the pipeline. Yeah. There has to be something there that be. they're not, they cannot risk moving Nate Oxberger to nine, uh, because that's just not where he has the biggest impact. There's going to be a signing in the pipeline somewhere. It's just a matter of who and where is that coming from and what kind of quality player they're getting. But this just tells me that we should expect San Diego to make a big halfback signing at some point. Yeah, well, according to us right now, there's no one on their roster list right now that's at that nine position. And again, I, I agree with you, Matt. Yeah, Oxberger. But I mean, hold on. Uh, if they don't sign anybody, I can draft Oxberger back at that nine position. No, you could. But I mean, and I was just going to mention that, though. Um, yeah, imagine he, he, you saw you draft him as that nine position. They sign someone midway through, and then all of a sudden you have him back at your back three. Yeah, it's all it's all mm -hmm. mind games going forward. But uh, I mean, Nate Oxberger, if he does move to the nine position, which again I don't foresee happening, no. but that'll take a big hit for him fantasy wise. Um, he just obviously won't have that same dynamic ability at scoring fantasy points uh, from the scrum half position. Uh, but at least from a team perspective, yeah, I mean that team is so much more dynamic with Nate Oxberger and what he was able to do last year. I expect and predict as well that something is coming down the line yeah. here where uh the the legion will be signing a, a scrum half um again jason higgins he was adequate and he was going to be the guy that kind of had that opportunity he probably would have been a high draft commodity he probably still is a high draft commodity here because i agree with you i think he it probably has the upper edge over michael baska for the chicago hounds um and and we'll see what he does again jason higgins from a fantasy perspective has shown spurts of of what he's able to do um i believe last year he had you know um you know uh, try assist games we had I remember if I recall um, there was a couple uh, maybe a season before where he showed where his ability to score tries as well yeah um, it was or, it, it was two years ago he had that hat trick I remember I picked him up I had him on my team or something yeah. like that um, but yeah for sure I think 
to be fair, I still see his value go a bit down now uh, just because you're going from that San Diego Legion side in offensive powerhouse to Chicago who has struggled. Uh, sure. And we don't know what to expect from them. So it'll be interesting to, to kind of see. I think his fantasy value goes a little bit down. Uh, but like you said, I think he's still a commodity as a starting nine in the league. And I mean, uh, to, to look on the other side of the trade with this Hugh Roach uh, side of things, I mean, there's potential here. Hugh Roach yeah. could skyrocket back up to being one of the premier front rowers in a fantasy perspective for this upcoming season. I mean, we saw what Hugh Roach was able to do on a strong Austin Gilgronis team when he was there. Um, obviously, just didn't get the same... Uh, 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 you know, start uh, ability that we were seeing with the Chicago mm-hmm. Hounds. I mean, we see we, that that front row is pretty locked up and pretty uh, uh, pretty busy uh, there. I believe they have you know Lindsey Stevens there. Um, they have um, uh, just pulling it up here their roster. Uh, Charlie Abel was a big part of that. George Thornton. We did see Hugh Roach make uh, uh, make contributions to there. But yeah, moving to the San Diego Legion where they've lost so many. We saw what Sam Malolo yeah. was able to do. And I'm not saying that Hugh Roach has the same ability as Sam Malolo, but even getting the opportunity that Malolo was getting, yeah. that'll be a big step up for for, yeah. for for Hugh Roach. And let's temper this with that. You know, Hugh Roach did get beat out by Lindsey Stevens for the job. I know Hugh Roach got hurt. But Lindsey Stevens, I think, took over that that job last year. Um, so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I think Hugh Roach might be a little sneaky little sleeper late-round draft pick this year that you might want to pick up, um, depending on what signings happen for the rest of the offseason. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, going to be gonna be interesting there. Um, anything else that you want to say uh, about the, uh, uh, about the uh, Chicago Hounds and San Diego Legion trade? Nope. Right, I, think that's, that, I think we covered it all. All right, let's move on over now to some of these signings here. Uh, we'll start off with Chicago. Uh, not a big one here, but Justin Nakombua is returning to the uh, to the Chicago Hounds. Um, he is a back rower, not really fantasy relevant. Five fantasy yeah. points on the season. Um, so again, he he is moving there. Uh, let's go to the Toronto Arrows. Um, of course, what's a what's a roster? Uh, news and notes segment without talking about the Toronto Arrows re-signings because that's obviously what they've been doing all offseason long. Uh, the nice. Arrows here, uh, Lolani Faleva uh, is returning to the uh, Toronto Arrows, uh, front rower for the squad. Um, this one's actually a pretty fantasy I think- relevant. I mean, Faleva was definitely fantasy relevant, had streaming capabilities there when you need the front row position when he was starting. Yeah. Forward of the year for the Arrows, 25 uh, MLR caps with Toronto since 22, 13 of those starts, six tries in that time frame um Faleva, i mean uh returning with the with the arrows here yeah i would argue not even just a streamer a guy to have on the roster i mean it was unfortunately it was on the arrows and that's probably what made him into a streamer but his offensive ability and his his just way to score tries as a front row and not a hooker you know playing as a prop and kind of reminding you or being a little bit like jared adams and having that try scoring or like meters gained ability um yeah, it was he was he's definitely a guy that you should look out for next season. Um and definitely a guy that should be on rosters next season as well. Yeah, finished off. Uh, I want to do some counting here uh, as the uh, fl- uh, front row seven uh, this past season. So, yeah, definitely yeah. more than just streaming capability there. He could uh, slot you in, especially if you had confidence there with him. So it should be interesting. Other re-signings for the Arrows. Uh, Kobe Faust re-signs uh, with the Arrows. Uh, back three player there, 38.9 fantasy points last season. And Shea Carey, second rower, uh, re-signing with the Arrows as well, 31.4. Yeah. I actually like this Shea, well, this Shea Carey one. He was hurt a lot last year it'll be good to see him get kind of a full season and i think he'll end up on fantasy rosters if he's able to get a full season in absolutely all right shifting on over to the nola gold a uh, couple of signings that they had uh they actually steal isaac salmon uh from uh the uh toronto arrows front rower signing with the nola gold again not really fantasy relevant 15 fantasy points for isaac mm-hmm. salmon um and then reese botha is returning to the nola gold 27 fantasy points there as uh, rodney iona's backup um couple uh kind of you know depth pieces there for uh, the nola gold coming in yeah, interesting to see what this means for Rod and Iona's future. I know they were both there last year, but um, you know, Reese Botha did have some games starting, and I don't think Rodney Iona nef- necessarily had the outstanding season that maybe they were hoping. 
And then shifting on over to the Utah Warriors, uh, Paul Mullen, front rower for the Warriors, is re-signing 38.2 fantasy points last season. Again, kind of one of those streaming guys. If he was starting, you maybe had the potential to slot him in. Uh, but the kind of the big news here for the Utah Warriors is they have finally signed Spencer Jones officially after that trade that occurred um, about a month ago um, on October 21st, where they traded a 2024 first-round pick and 2024 salary cap considerations for Spencer Jones uh, from the New England Free Jacks. Uh, he's coming to the Utah Warriors. Interesting signing there, making it official. Yeah, I mean, I think we I think we weren't expecting anything else to happen after that trade. Um, and yeah, we said it after the trade. I think this is good for that that Utah Warriors back, back line. I think this helps Spencer Jones' value. Um, and yeah, I'd love to see it for Spencer Jones because he's he has a chance to be a really impactful player. Uh, and then this is where we start to see, uh, after the, the completion of the Bunnings MPC, this is where we're starting to see some of these flurries of signings coming mm -hmm. into the MLR. Um, Utah Warriors kind of starting that trend. Uh, Frank Lawchor, uh, second rower, signing from the Hawks Bay Magpies. He's going to the Utah Warriors. And Dylan Nell, back rower from Southland, is also going to the Utah Warriors. Yeah, Utah Warriors putting together a nice little offseason here. And it's, uh, you know, even after the great season that they had, um, I'm looking forward to seeing the product that they can put out on the field. Uh, and then now on to the Houston Sabercats, a couple signings for them. Uh, they get Tian Erasmus, front rower who played for Rugby Atlanta last season. He signs with the Sabercats. Again, another one of those depth pieces. And then Emmanuel Albert is re-signing with the Sabercats. Back rower had 45 fantasy points uh, last season for the Cats. Yeah. Brian Ray called this out. And I think we mentioned his tweet out like a month ago. He called this out and, uh, I guess he knows their roster better than them. So he already knew this stuff and so did we. Um, and just Houston had to make it official. All right. New England Free Jacks making some signings here. Again, kind of following the trend of uh, Bunnings NPC guys coming over to the MLR. Uh, Sean Ralph, front rower signing from Waikato, is going to the Free Jacks. And then Malachi Hala Natai. Nice. Nah, I, tie. I think that was right. Signing from Manawatu, uh, he's going to the New England Free Jacks as well. Uh, has also U-20 All Blacks appearances under his belt as well. Yeah, I mean, this is just bolstering that New England Free Jacks roster. I actually think front row is probably one of the areas where they definitely could have used some signings, and this is kind of a good look for them and, and will definitely help them out this year. Uh, Old Glory DC, this is probably the most fantasy relevant uh, signing uh, coming in after Lolani Faleva. Uh, Tavita Nakali, second rower, re signing uh, with the Old Glory DC. 75.7 fantasy points uh, for Old Glory DC last season. Um, again, with just how the uh, lack of scoring that happens at that second row position, I mean, Tavita Naka uh, Nakali uh, finishing off as the second row 13. Um, I mean, adequate. He was on uh, Raw rosters last season um i think he missed some time there it possibly i believe was due to injury but i mean he was adequate when he uh when he played had a season high 17 points scored in round five when he racked up 92 meters gain had 16 tackles and a breakdown steal uh potential is there for tavita nakali if he can stay healthy yeah it was definitely a good streamer last year um so yeah we'll see how he goes this year it's good seeing him back in the old glory dc squad uh, Logan Widener signing with Old Glory DC, uh, last coming from Racing Club Narbonne, a U.S. and Canada eligible player. Wow, Should this be guy. interesting to see what this he does guy, for Old Glory right. DC. This guy plays age grade for both U.S. and Canada, <laughs> and he's chosen his legion. Uh, he's decided, it seems like, that he's going to be playing for the U.S., and I don't blame him. After watching Canada for the past year of playing rugby and seeing just what a crapshoot that the Rugby Canada organization is, uh, good for him on making some good career decisions. Uh, the Dallas Jackals uh, making some younger signings here. Lance Fenumawai, wow. uh, front rower, signing Good from St. Vincent College. He went undrafted. Um, and then Noah Wright, their third-round pick from this past year's draft, who played at Central Washington University, uh, back three players signing with the Dallas Jackals as well. I uh, don't think much to be said there. Uh, it just seems more. like they're making a nice concerted effort to make sure they have enough uh, domestic players to be able to <laughs> No kidding. Roster. No kidding. All right, Seattle Seawolves making a couple uh, overseas signings. Jade Styling, uh, back three player, played for the Pumas, um, has exp in, in the Curry Cup, has exp experience playing the with the Blue Bulls, um, also has, I believe, super rugby experience. Um, again, that back three just getting more bolstered for the Seattle Seawolves. Yeah, and nice then little replacement for Carl's. 
Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, no, not to mention, yeah, with the loss or the trade of that move in over, or excuse me, the move from him going to um, the Dallas. Uh, Dallas Jackals should be interesting. Uh, Who Taylor, second rower, uh, signing from the Dragons, played in the URC. Again, another international Chicago. signing he there. He went to too. Chicago. Oh, Hugh Taylor went, went to Chicago. Chicago. Oh, he, my, he came from Dallas, went to Seattle, now back at Chicago. Okay, well, not my back, apologies. But now there. he went to Chicago. Chicago there. All right, Hugh Taylor going to Chicago. Um, no, 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 no. What Ryan. are you saying? What are you talking about? Carl went to Chicago. Oh, oh, I'm talking about he Hugh Taylor. Ta I know, but I was just saying that Jade <laughs> Styling might be a nice little replacement for Carl's. And Carl's didn't go back to Dallas. He came from Dallas, went to Seattle. Now he's in Chicago. Hugh That's Taylor, correct. to clarify for everybody, is not going to Chicago. <laughs> he is going to Seattle. All right. You're getting me all mixed up here on the run now, but it's all good. Uh, he's going to Seattle, second rower, had experience. I was going to say, I don't recall him ever playing with the, the MLR nope. side. Uh, but with how many signings, hard to keep track of. Uh, played with the Dragons in the URC. Again, another depth piece there to see what maybe they get out of another international signing for the Seattle Seawolves. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, Seattle Seals continues like the New England Free Jacks, like the other top teams in the league, continue to find a way to bolster their team. Um, second row is definitely a position that you need some talent, and I'm excited to see this guy in the MLR. All right, and then the last team here to go over the Miami Sharks making moves still have a lot of uh, not so much clear uh, uh, or clarity, I should say, about the roster that the Miami Sharks are going to be putting out in this 2024 season. It's getting clearer by the day, more or less. Uh, this one's an interesting one. It's something that they announced a while ago and included in kind of their get to know the players, but they officially announced the signings uh, this past week. Uh, Rob Evans, front rower, Kirby Myhill, front rower, both with Welsh international experience, uh, both come in, uh, uh, Rob Evans playing uh, in the Pro 12, Kirby Mile playing for Cardiff. Got some international experience coming in for the Miami Sharks. Yeah, That's I mean, not coming South off, American. <laughs> yes, coming off the World Cup. I mean, this will be interesting. I actually think that, you know, more so Kirby Mile, just with that experience at Hooker, can definitely be a guy that will end up being on our fantasy rosters. Uh, we might even look at Rob Evans as well, but talk about this invasion of Welsh internationals. I mean, Hugh Taylor, you know, that name straight out of straight out of Wales coming from Newport, um, Rob Evans, Kirby Myhill. I mean, we got South Americans, we got South Africans, we got Kiwis, uh, or people from New Zealand. We got the Welsh, we got Englishmen, uh, you know, the MLR is just a melting pot of all all these internationals and it's great to see that it's not just uh we're not just pulling from new zealand we're not just pulling from south africa everybody in the world and globally wants to come and play in the mlr and have an opportunity to play in, the, in, in north america all right well I wanted to fly through those signings because the biggest news and note that we want to get to here is the announcement of a brand new league format by major league rugby and again this was kind of teased and it was in the hopper that this something like this was going to happen uh but it's officially happened mlr has tweeted it out and it's, it's shown what it is going to look like um for those of you who have not seen it uh the mlr is now splitting up into three divisions they obviously had two last season with the east and the west but they're now splitting up to three having a west a central and an east um which is quite interesting uh the, the the format before we kind of break down break it down matt each team will play every other team at least once you're going to play your uh the the players in your uh, division twice both a home and away game um West and Central Division teams will play one Central West Division team twice. Um, and then it's a 16-game season, just like last year. Uh, teams will play eight home matches and eight away matches. Uh, the interesting thing is obviously the playoff implications. Division winners automatic uh, buy into the quarterfinals of the playoffs. And then it is going to seed them the next six best teams after that, I believe. Um, and they'll seed them four through eight after those division winners. Um, and we'll have a eight team playoff, which is the biggest that the MLR has seen um, up to date. So, I mean, <laughs> this is, this is, this is interesting. I mean, it's great. First of all, I think we just got to commend the Los Angeles rugby. I'm surprised they didn't just use the Giltini's logo. They should have <laughs> just used that one. Uh, that would have been great. Um, so I guess it's confirmed that there is going to be Los Angeles rugby playing in this year's season, which is great to hear because 
we have no idea what's happening with that. I team. mean, it's concerning though that they haven't made this announcement and yet there's still no idea what is happening. So I guess yeah, they have I confidence mean, it's going to come in, but I mean, we're we're uh Brian Ray tweeted it out that we have what uh, you know, internationals are coming in or uh in in the second week of january and we're already in the late end of november and we still have no idea what this team is called yeah. what players are on this team they were shipping out a whole bunch of guys obviously rugby atlanta was fire sailing everyone yeah. and yet we still have no idea but again that's yeah. kind of a little yeah yeah they're probably i mean they're just thing. they're just trying to find gilchrist right now so he'll come <laughs> back and then the team will start heading in and running uh in bankruptcy uh but yeah, this is this is interesting. I I you know, I like I like the way that they split it up. I think it brings a little bit of a um it brings a little bit of a North American flair to it is what it does in my okay. opinion. Um it basically is kind of like this NFL style of hey, you you're going to have these big division matchups every mm-hmm. year. You're going to have division rivalries and then you're going to have these these different cross division matchups that's going to vary every year. Um, and, and I think it brings that kind of idea in. I hope what this does is, you know, for example, well, it's gone now, but w- what used to be the fire and ice cup, um, you know, it, it creates these, these really hopefully a history and deep woven rivalries between mm-hmm. teams. And I hope that ends up being, you know, like a, a new England free Jacks versus New York. That becomes where we know we're going to play you two times a year. Every time, two times a year, it's going to be a dogfight because we're fighting for something bigger than just just the season game. Uh, my one gripe with this, though, is that, you know, eight teams out of 12 are making the playoffs. That's true. Is that what we want to see? You know, I, I, everybody loves a good underdog. Everybody loves, uh, you know, an eighth seed beating a one seed. Um, but, man, it, it's like, it feels like almost too many teams, uh, but I, I don't know how else they would have gone about it. I, right. I'm not sure. Tra- I'm not quite sure. And that was the question that I had when I was breaking this down with uh, John Fitzpatrick of Rugby Morning on the Glorious Rugby Podcast. I had assumed that they were not going to extend it the playoffs to eight teams because of yeah. that notion that eight out of twelve teams, um, or or I should say eight out of thirteen teams, um, uh, are making it to the playoffs. I mean that that's that's a tough that's a tough thing to kind of get around. So with the three and odd odd number divisions, I didn't know how they were going to go about making that equal. You know what yeah. I mean? Having well, having doing that because I guess the next thing is maybe you know but, go with six teams and you have three division winners and then the next three guys come in and the top two teams get a buy and then you kind of go with the same format yeah. that you had uh, with the, mean, the, the top two seeds getting buys and having this kind of uh, pseudo quarterfinal yeah. heading into it. Um, but I agree with you. I think eight teams out of 13 is tough uh, coming in. But again, who knows? Yeah. Maybe we'll have some Cinderella stories we love. I mean, I'm sure we will get that, but like, let's look at last year's, uh, like last year's playoffs. So we think about it in terms of, all right, Chicago, NOLA, Toronto, Dallas. I don't want to see any of those teams in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't care to see Chicago the way that they're playing Dallas, the way that they're playing. I definitely didn't want to see Toronto in the playoffs. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't want to see, I don't care to see any of those teams. And those are the bottom four. Well, you know, when you look at relative, it was like 11 teams last year Yeah. or no, still the, still the 12 or no, 11 teams last year. And, you know, let's say 12 teams, 12 teams, 12 teams. Wasn't it 12 teams? No. Cause Miami wasn't there. Uh, 11, they had a weird odd number. Um, and, and you look at it, Ryan, you're doing the matches. Trust me. No. Cause rugby Miami. Atlanta was Los Angeles. Yes. But then yeah. they didn't have Miami. Yeah. So it's 12. No. So last year they had 11. Okay. Well, because there's 13 right now. You're adding Miami. Oh, I didn't even realize there was five. Okay, there's 12. There's 12. All right. But anyways, I still don't want to see any of those four four teams in the sure. playoffs. Right? Like, yeah, okay. Like, we need to have – you. I thought Utah – in this case, we get Utah in the playoffs, mm-hmm. um, which is nice. I think we really wanted to see Utah in the playoffs. I don't want to see the New York Ironworkers of last year in the playoffs. I didn't want to see them. Like they they stunk last year. They didn't deserve to be in the playoffs. And um, yeah, it's just I'm okay with it. I'm fine with it. I don't have too big of an issue with it. 
I'm just hoping that we don't end up seeing a ridiculous one seed facing the an eight seed that has no has no right to be and, in a playoff matchup. I mean, I guess it's give or take because I think what what's positive here and what eliminates what you were seeing with for example, last year with the New York Ironworkers squeaking in and the Utah Warriors not making it, is that now instead of having just the top three teams of each division making it in, after those division winners, it's just seeded four through eight, right? So if you have a yeah. lopsided, if you have a lopsided thing there, you might have, right? It just looking sure. at the divisions now, um, I mean, you look at that that West Division. I mean, outside of off That's Los gonna Angeles, be you're probably going to have that. The East Division is going to be should be pretty beast with having the Free Jacks or Gore DC being optimistic that the Iron Workers turn it around and are better than what they were last year. Um, you're at least going to be able to pull teams. Wow, that Central Division divisions. sucks. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that it's not that Central there, Division. I mean, the I mean let's, if we're are looking laughing. At, I mean, <laughs> if we're looking at it, like yeah, that is a rough. Central, well, it's a like you said, it's a rough central division for everybody except Houston. Yeah, and um, I mean, okay, if I had to make a prediction right now, and I know it's very, very early in terms of kind of how this is all playing out, I think Houston SaberCats win the central division. You agree with me there? Yeah, probably. I think the San Diego Legion probably win the West, but with the change that they have, could be yeah. Seattle too. Um, yeah. And then I think the New England Free Jacks are winning the East. So those are your three teams. Who are the next five coming in? My yeah, guess I mean, is the rest of the Western Conference, except for the Los Angeles rugby team, right? So you got three yeah. there. Uh, you have the Houston Sabercats, the four. You have the New England Free Jacks, which is five. I'm saying Old Glory, D.C., and then New York, and maybe NOLA saying that. Yeah, are you writing unless... off Miami already? <laughs> well, we don't even know what this team is. <laughs> so it's tough. I think Miami looks a lot better than Chicago did. Like better than, sure. better than NOLA. I mean, that Miami side is looks talented. That Miami side looks incredibly talented. Like, just look at the nine and ten Kubeli yeah. and Nico Sanchez. Like, that's enough for me to have a, quite a bit of faith in them. Yeah. Um. So w we'll see. But yeah, I I just the season has to matter, right? Yeah. Like the season has to matter. I can't go under five hundred. You know, like the Eastern conference was last year. Like you could go under 500 and find a way to make the playoffs. That's not how it should be. You but again, need... that's, I think that's why yeah. that four through eight is going to help it out. You know what I mean? It's not just like, if it was, if they came out and said the top two teams from each division are going to make it, that yeah. would have been a little bit more rough. But the fact that it's just a division winner and you can, I think there's one team in each division you can say deserves to be in the playoff. I think yeah. there's no, there's no, division well, that's completely out of whack um now I'm kind of like four through eight yeah but now i'm kind of like what's even the point of these divisions just don't just have everyone play uh, you know i think it's to your point is to create this north american rivalry to create these yeah. vision to these division uh things and i i mean i i would say that you know toronto is probably not complaining as much because they're not gonna have to travel as much right you're playing two that teams down true. your division right you got the free jacks yeah, yeah. right Cutting around the down. corner yeah. You're cutting down that 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 travel time. I mean, that central division is kind of tough. You know, going going from Chicago to to Houston, um, and, and yeah. Chicago well, to Toronto's got to go down to Miami. That that is true. But at least you're. I mean, on the East I mean, Coast. all the teams in the Eastern Seaboard have to go down to Miami. Yeah, is yeah. basically what's happening. And <laughs> yeah. I mean, so. yeah, I, I, I can see that definitely be a cost saving thing. Um, it just yeah, I, I'm interested to see how this looks. I would, I'm looking forward to see what the eighth seed looks like. Who is that eighth seed? Is that eighth seed going to be a, hey, they have a chance to beat the one seed, or is it going to be this game's going to suck and it's just sure. going to be a blowout? So I would love to see that. I, I'm happy that they did this to experiment it with the number of teams that they have sure. now. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to see what happens. I think personally what I would have liked now thinking it through and talking out loud I would have liked to see three divisions, winner of each division makes playoffs, three more teams get added in, right? Uh, seeds four through six make it into yeah. playoffs. The top two teams, the two division winners with the best record get a bye. 
and then the top division, uh, this the third best division winner faces the sixth seed, and then you got to battle for four and five. I'm just not kind of to your same sentiment, Matt. I don't like the fact that you have a majority of teams making the playoffs now, and I'm interested to see who that eight team is going to be. But I guess to your point as well, would you rather that? And I guess this is uh, this is uh, to be decided after we get to see the 2024 year. Would you rather that? Or would you rather what we saw last year? And you're forcing teams from the Eastern Conference to make it into the playoffs. That's kind of... Yeah, but I think with the way that we had it, it was like if the East sucked, then... The Eastern playoffs, it was all on equal level playing ground except the New England Free Jacks. Sure, sure. Mind you, what this does eliminate now is that idea of, you know, there's the East Conference that sucks. If a bad team makes it out of the Eastern Conference, then that final is going to suck. You know, that final... Sure, sure. Yeah, I see what you're saying. The chances of having a, a, a dominant Western Conference team beating the champion of the Eastern conference team was just higher because you know, the, the, the Western right. conference is so much more dominant And this way. What you're we see now, at least you're eliminating that whole, a dominant East versus a dominant West. It is simply based on how you finished on the season. This is where you slot in and may the best team win. Right. Regardless of whether East or West. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I guess it's something like we that. didn't kind of mention. I'm kind of sad that you don't have that whole Eastern and Western conference. Sure. I feel like that is a very much a staple of North American sports as well. Right. So right. you give and take, uh, it is what it is. Uh, I would love to see, and this is like four or five years down the road, but like we get to add one more team for central, one more team for West. We keep the same eight teams, make the playoffs. Suddenly now, eight out of 15 teams are making the playoffs. Right. That to me is like a whole much better right there. That's the perfect balance. Yeah. Like I agree. you don't need 30 MLR teams right there. 15 teams, five, each division, eight teams out of 15 making the playoffs and that's it. And that's right. all you need. And that right there is, I think where the MLR should sit at and where the MLR should thrive. And that I think, I'm hoping that they're doing this and setting this up with that in mind, right, knowing right. that, yes, right now, eight out of 13 doesn't seem as nice, but eight out of 15, look, that makes a lot that, that, that right there is, is, is a good proportion of teams making the playoffs. Sure. And I guess uh, to kind of wrap up this conversation from a fantasy perspective, it's loan to it's, it's, it's to be seen how this kind of affects fantasy circles. Again, I think this yeah. is obviously just a conversation to have because this is obviously the, a, well, a big structured change of the league that we follow. Um, I think but. I was just thinking, right. Houston players, their value should go up. Sure. Houston players. Sure. Let's not count out Dallas so quickly and, and Nola and even Chicago, honestly, they've, they've all improved. Right. But when you're looking at it now, you take last year's experience and you look, Hey, 50% or over 50% of the games for majority of the games in a season, Houston is going to be the dominant opponent in their, in their, in, in their games. Right. Right. Um, that's a good sign for fantasy players. And that's like, that's a good sign for when you're looking at, at picking up Houston players and you know, <laughs> so even, you're saying that I need to pick up Lurets Vanderskiff again and he should be in my top five. Oh, centers hey, he's again. just going <laughs> to, he's going to be in your top five centers and then he's going to be in your bust at the end of the year. So that's just going to happen all over again. Oh um, yeah, no kidding. But yeah, I mean, I think that, I think that's the way that you look at it. When we look at things fantasy wise, that's the way that I see it. Sure. Um, I see the West as like, you know, the West is like, that's just a bruiser. Like yeah. that is a, a yeah. bruising division there. And, and I think it's just, that one's going to be a tough one. You look at the East as well. Central to me is the one where you're like, this is where I see the fantasy impact because from his, what history says is Nola gold Dallas and Chicago have not been strong teams. Yeah. No, that's like a great point. And I think to wrap up again, this conversation, um, I didn't think I was going to be saying this um, when I first heard rumors that this was going to happen, but after seeing it on paper, I actually think I like it more than more than what we had last year. And I'm excited to see kind of how this all plays out again. Um, would I like the teams to be down to to six instead of eight? But then to your point, Matt, in, in, in hopes of them expanding it. I like this format and I think it's going to be fun to watch in 2024. Yeah. And I'm just going through. I mean, so to balance out the whole five, four and four, 
we got the whole West and Central playing each other. Right. And the West team, the West division is playing Central twice, right? Mm -hmm. Along with everybody in their own division. Again, you know, maybe I'm looking at the West division. They're playing these Central teams twice. <laughs> you You're looking it. at that West division as like a, as like <laughs> the one guys the one to pick year. up. Like I would stand <laughs> like for, for fantasy rugby. I would like the East division is scary. Like th that. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to pick guys playing the New England Free Jacks twice. I don't want to pick guys That's playing true. the it's Miami Sharks twice. Yeah, sure. I want to pick guys that are playing the Arrows, but like, you got to balance that out. Like, at least if I'm picking up a San Diego Legion player, I know that they're going to play the Dallas Jackals twice in the year. I know that they're going to play the Chicago Hounds twice in a year. Um, or even Seattle Seawolves. And maybe that's a reason for you to pick up a, a guy in the Western Conference over a guy in the in the Eastern Conference who maybe you have sitting in the, in similar rankings in your in your draft board. Just remember though that it's going to be one out of those division teams when it comes to the Central West. It's not all the teams that they're going to be playing True. twice again. So it's going to be there if they're luck out, if San Diego Legion lucks out and, and they're the one team that's going to be playing the Chicago Hounds twice. I mean, you got to look uh, at that, but again, it, it'll, be, yeah. it'll be interesting. But again, I we'll mean, I that. think it's yeah. You think you All like right. it better than than last year? I mean, I know we haven't seen it yet. The idea, though, I think excites me more than what we've seen last year. I, again, I'd rather see a crappy eight team and and, and get in and, and know that the yeah. San Diego Legion or the New England Free Jacks are going to knock them out in the first round than having yeah. sat with a crappy Eastern Conference playoff. Um, we're going to be more assured here moving forward in this format that we'll be getting a semifinal that's worth semifinal value. We're going to be getting a final that is worth final value, um, which which is always what people want to see, the highest level of competition. Yeah, and I think – I don't even think – like the playoff part is not where I see the most uh, – the biggest plus of this. Uh, to me, especially for the East because they're the only one that is kind of – I think following what the MLR want is that the East is going to have a chance to play their own division twice, every team in their own division twice, and then play everybody else once. And when you, and you and I both know this, right? Like when you see an opponent more often in a season mm -hmm. than other opponents, you grow this sense of, you know, rivalry with them. And, and these division games become a little bit bigger and, and, and that happens. And I'm just looking forward to kind of, the way that this is like ads for storyline, the marketing, the promotion of the games, I think it's going to be great. And I think when we look at this, you know, five years down the road, um, we see like a deep rooted rivalry between some of these inner conference teams um, yeah. and inner division teams. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, should be should be fun. So I guess we'll find out in 2024. But yep. it's definitely got me excited and looking for even more forward to this 2024 year. Um, couple other kind of news and notes from around the rugby world, uh, at least from the MLR sense. Uh, we were talking about with this new uh, partnership with Kappa. We're waiting for these jerseys to be released, and it looks like the New England yep. Free Jacks might be the first ones to release it. It looks like they're releasing it in early November. Uh, they tweeted out that they're going to have a season member winter party and jersey reveal, um, aka Kit. Miss. I love Kitmas. Um, so uh, that will be on December. Yeah, 5th. I hate, I hate to spoil it for you people, it. but it's going to be horizontal stripes and <laughs> friggin' collar. So, yeah, no kidding. Way to go. No kidding. When have they not? Have, when have they not been horizontal stripes in a collar? So, Even, yeah, no. That's that's, that's, that's it. Way to go. Um, nice all surprise. Right. Well, wait, wait to ruin Kitmas, Grinch. All right. Wait, yeah. wait. <laughs> Wasn't me. Maybe they should start getting a little bit more creative. Yeah, uh, well, we'll see. Uh, there's always a chance. There's always a chance. New we'll Jersey sponsor. You know, um, last year, we saw the income of Gradients. So this year, who, what does Kappa have in their pocket? I guess we'll, we'll find out starting with the New England Free Jacks on December 5th. And then mm -hmm. to round out the news and notes portion with a little bit of international rugby news, uh, the final rounds of La Via uh, uh, Internacional uh, played nice. this past weekend. Uh, Canada obviously losing that first matchup pretty badly to Spain and then having USA beating Brazil. Uh, USA went on to face Spain. And I guess we'll start off on a little bit of positive news there. USA taking care of business 42 to 12 against Spain. Uh, Nate Oxberger scoring try Dylan Fawcett scoring a try um, Joe Mano getting in there as well. So some notable MLR names and a team that took on Canada and took care of business there. 
USA said, no problem for us. We're going to take home this La Via International uh, Rugby Cup and uh, and look pretty solid um, and making some pretty big improvements there after how kind of down it was after they didn't make the Rugby World Cup. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. You know, good to see U.S. Uh, good to see U.S. kind of do their thing. Uh, definitely be an upside. Uh, I didn't get a chance to watch the game. I thought it would be a little closer between them and Spain, um, but they seem to be heading in a completely different direction than Canada. Even though Canada got the win, well, I won't spoil. Uh, I'll just segue into it. So let's just even spoil though, it. Say it. Even though Canada beat Brazil forty to fifteen in that semis, um, I don't think Canada looked that great from all the reports that I saw of the game. Um, no surprise there. I honestly wish Brazil won just to give, you know, something's got to knock some sense in this rugby Canada organization. And somebody has got to tell them that, Hey, we're not, we're not in the right spot. And a loss to Brazil would definitely be that. Um, so yeah, uh, good for the U S Canada. I mean, you still stink. Yeah. I mean, 40 to 15 over Brazil hat trick for, uh, Lucas rumble though, uh, coming off of his 50th hey. cap. Um, Starting Love to, to see some, that. Starting to build some hype for him uh, heading into the fantasy MLR season because if he's able to do things like that, um, he might look yeah. like a pretty good pick uh, for this upcoming fantasy season. Um, but yeah, I do think that the sentiment and the and the feeling around these two sides are becoming more and more um, separated. I think there's a lot of optimism with this Team USA, mm-hmm. uh, the USA Eagles, kind of moving forward here, and they seem to be on the right track, especially seeing guys that are fantasy or that are MLR relevant, making that impact for the USA, which is ironic because I get it. Canada only has the arrows to kind of do that through, but that has been such a, you know, mantra of the Toronto arrows to kind of develop this Canadian squad through uh, the arrows and, and use can Canadian eligible players. And, and it doesn't seem to be working when it is working quite nicely for USA in terms of some of the players that are, uh, you know, making an impact for them are relevant there in, in the MLR. So again, obviously two different conversations because the arrows are only one Canadian team and you got a whole bunch of us teams in major league rugby. But again, uh, I think the feeling around these two international sides it's getting uh, more and more different by the day it goes, especially after yep. this overseas uh, competition. So um, for sure, we'll, we'll see kind of how that progresses yep. forward. But uh, uh, all right, a couple things right yep. before we close out. One, uh, going back to Kit Miss a little bit. If I see Rugby New York put out some jersey with a f- stupid bridge on it, uh, <laughs> I swear. And we're still waiting I for their swear. signings. We we still we're they still, still have New Zealand big signings that they teased three weeks ago, and they haven't done a thing. <laughs> they haven't said a thing. They yeah. haven't done anything. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I think. Uh, uh, oh man, <laughs> Nate Brakley. I believe he retired from. Uh, he retired from international rugby. Okay. After the game, so we'll see what that means for his MLR. I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure that means he's also retired from the MLR. So. They haven't announced signings, but they lose Nate Brakely. Um, but I'm sure he'll still be part of the program um, somehow. But yeah, w- what the heck, New York? Do something. Like, just do something. And and when I say something, that doesn't mean you throw another bridge on your friggin' jersey. So that's what I'll say there. Another, Ryan, quick correction to one of our points earlier of Jason Higgins. I believe, yes, while Chicago, it'll be a good impact on Chicago. They did sign uh, Nick McCarthy from overseas, the U.S. born, uh, and who also just played for the U.S. in that game and scored a try. Um, They did sign Nick McCarthy earlier in the offseason. So I don't think he has that clear of a starting role, and I definitely think Nick McCarthy will be that starter. Um, But it'll be interesting to see how Jason Higgins goes on for Chicago. Yeah, I guess we'll see. All right. Well, to close out this show, um, it is the week of Thanksgiving. So we got thought we'd get into the holiday spirit. And what better way? I said it at the teaser. Um, what what are the similarities between fantasy MLR and Thanksgiving? Wow. Well, we always come to Thanksgiving with some good Thanksgiving meals. And when it comes to fantasy MLR, you know, each position has its benefits when it comes to providing you for your fantasy squad, almost like each kind of side or each dish at a Thanksgiving meal Mm. provides its benefits and its negative 
aspects of it. So we're going to break down kind of which position equates to each Thanksgiving side. And, and I thought we'd have a little bit of fun with this and have a little bit of fun heading into this uh, Thanksgiving weekend. And, and it, 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 it'll be a little bit of fun here. So obviously, Matt, the biggest meal and the biggest star of the Thanksgiving meal is the turkey. It's dependable. It's always good. Well, it's delicious. Um, mm. It's always the highlight and the star when it comes to Thanksgiving. Um, mm. Who for you is the star, dependable, always good position when it comes to your fantasy lineup? That would be the turkey of fantasy MLR. Well, right. I'm going to kind of interject here and say turkey isn't always good. But yes, you know, it is it's, a it's okay. I'm starting to get on that sentiment too. And, you know, turkey. And Ryan, we had a harvest turkey three years ago. We had a harvest turkey three years ago. That <laughs> thing sucked. <laughs> yeah, that that thing, thing sucked. sucked. If you ever have picked a chance up, to buy a harvest turkey, from... <laughs> do not get a harvest turkey. That thing is not, you don't need that. You don't picked want it, that. Just get the one from, from, your, from your Costco's, you know, from your BJ's, from your Aldi's. Just get the normal. You don't need to go to a farm. <laughs> picked it up from a farm. Um, I don't think we've ever told this story on this podcast before, but Matt came up to uh, Pennsylvania for uh, for Thanksgiving weekend here, uh, paid me a visit. I thought I'd go all out. Obviously, Pennsylvania has no shortage of farms here in South Central PA. Um, thought I'd go. I saw that there was some harvest turkey uh, that I could go pick up, and there was no meat on that thing. <laughs> there was there was literally no meat on that thing. No it did meat. not taste um, that but great. But anyways, you know what does have turkey... meat on it, Ryan? Regular turkey, good turkey. You know what does have meat on them bones? It's the staple of your fantasy lineup, the, the, the centerpiece that you want to build around. It's always going to be that center and back row. You know, mm -hmm. you want to build around those guys. Those guys are, those guys are the guys that are going to get you points. Mm -hmm. That's the guys you rely on to help you win big in the weeks. Um, and those are the guys that you kind of need in order to hold everything else together. That's true. And yeah, you can always depend on, again, tackle numbers are always there. Meters gain numbers are always there. So despite being sometimes maybe off weeks, um, again, you can always depend on these guys. So I agree. I think the centers and the back row are your turkeys of your fantasy lineup. Now let, let's shift on over to the cranberry sauce. Now the cranberry sauce is a staple of Thanksgiving. You always see it there. Now myself, I'm not a big fan of uh, of cranberry sauce with my Loser. my thanksgiving meal but it is a staple you always see it there in that jar uh but sometimes it's not so great sometimes you have the the homemade one that tastes good it's in mm. it's in the nice little boat there and then sometimes you kind of get the cop out where it comes out of a can um not not as great um and and you're putting it on and it could ruin the whole meal so for you maddie who is that player on your fantasy lineup that that can be so good and is a staple of your lineup but sometimes it might might not be so great and it might just ruin your week so you know i'm gonna broaden this out and i know we're doing positions but i'm gonna broaden this out and i'm gonna say your kicker okay the guy you designate as your kicker is what can ruin your entire thanksgiving meal because you're expecting you know at least some conversions maybe some penalties to help boost up those points and then all of a sudden they're going 0 and 4 on conversions, one of <laughs> five on penalties, and yeah. and and you just wasted your kicker spot and it's a dud, and that would ruin your Thanksgiving dinner and your fantasy MLR team. That's true. All right, shifting on over to what my favorite, you know, meal yeah. of Thanksgiving is. I now love this. I can eat this love. all day. Uh, but the Thanksgiving stuffing. Stuffed. I love me some stuffing. Mm -hmm. um, I could just eat bowls of of, of that stuff. Uh, but it, it brings everything together. It often is, except for me. It often isn't the highlight for people, but it's always this something is your that, you, that you put on your plate. And it's always something that is in between all those sides and people enjoy. And it brings everything everything together. So Matt, for your fantasy lineup, who is the stuffing? Who is that position that just kind of, brings everything together and there's that kind of final touch between all those sides. Ah, uh, this is a this is a good one. Um to me, like the one that brings it together has to be and and I might disagree with you, Ryan, but I think this has to be the front row for me. Oh, really? You know, like I think you can have you have the you have the good turkey, right? You have the good center and back mm -hmm. row performance. 
You have the good kicker performance as well, you know, slash fly half from the cranberries also. You got those two good things. Mm -hmm. And then you're getting to the stuffing, right? And that what rounds it out will really, you know, what really rounds out your team and brings it together is when you have that performance from the front row, when you get those tries, those mall tries from the front row, that's what I think is, is what really brings it all together there. Um, and can really, really have a, a pretty big impact on your, on your fantasy MLR team. Okay. Well, for me, it is the scrum half because I think kind of sure. the same sentiment is that, you know, it's kind of just there. You know, you always, you always know it's going to be there. Your scrum half is always there. The stuffing is always there. Um, yeah. But when the stuffing, you know, when, when it's so good and well done and when the scrum have is able to kind of get that try assist, yeah. which usually corresponds with other guys on on uh, other positions getting scoring points there. Uh, th it's not the highlight. Scrum halves aren't the high. They're not usually the ones scoring tries, but they're the ones assisting them. I think the scrum half kind of brings all those positions together. It's a nice little indicator for other yes. teams as well. But, well, this is why I think they fit into the next category, right? All right. Well, that's what I think we just are swapping, flip, uh, flip-flopping back and forth. Um, mash potatoes. It's boring. It's nothing special. But when mashed potatoes hit, they hit good. And you put and some of that gravy saying, on it. Ryan. You have some of a little bit of that butter, a little bit of green onion, a little bit of chives. I'm... It could be really, really good. And I think, this to my point, I'll quickly say here, the front row was that for me. And I think we're just well, switching here because for me, front rows are boring. They're going to get you two or three points each week. You know, nothing special. It's just bland performances. Oh, but when when they add that butter, when that little bit of cream is in there, when that salt and pepper is just that perfect amount, and you put that gravy on top, and they're scoring you those tries, and they're getting into that end uh, that try zone, scoring those malls, mm -mm -mm, mashed potatoes can quickly you know, become the highlight. Maybe it was because I just had a different experience with the front rows <laughs> yeah, I had maybe. on my team, but this is the this is the scrum half. For, I mean, the scrum half you didn't expect much, right? You didn't always expect that much. In front row, you expected a try. A, a game i i thought that you would expect to try you would hope for a mall try and you'd hope for to get some good points scrum half it's like ah this is the position that's just i'm okay with it sucking but boy when your scrum half comes in and puts some tries on the boards when richard judd puts a hat trick on the board mm -hmm. when tusi tala comes in and shows his form when jason higgins does some crazy things too like he did two years ago and some racks up 30 points oof that is some good mashed potatoes, and that's going to be one good Thanksgiving. All right, shift on on over to another uh, side here. Uh, the dinner rolls, uh, they're nothing special. You really can't you can't do them wrong. You put them on the table. You hope people take them. It's not really you know anything that's highlighted. It's just there for you to have and with even, everything else. Yeah. And even um, when they do well, Ryan, even when the dinner rolls are amazing, they're not going like, to get it's 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 flowers. Yeah. That, it's I not, think we, <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not crazy, crazy. You're just like, you're there. You helped me get the win. Good for you. But let now me go tell back you, in your basket. Have you ever tried a Sam Gala dinner roll? Wow. All right. Well, that kind of spoils it there for us. The dinner rolls of the Thanksgiving meal of your fantasy lineup is the second rower. They're not getting you really many fantasy points. Even when they do good, they're really not that great, except for a Sam Gollum. I mean, Sam Gollum must be one of those, you know, baker rolls, homemade, perfectly done. The yeast, yeah. the, everything is just amazing. And it's just perfectly crunchy on the outside and tender in the middle. That's probably the Sam Gola dinner roll that you're thinking about, right? <laughs> all right. And to wrap it all up, it's the thing that everyone looks forward to. All eyes are on the prize, and that is the dessert of Thanksgiving. And typically, that's a dang good baked pumpkin pie. Um, everyone's looking forward to the dessert. They've finished their turkey. They've had it with their stuffing and their mashed potatoes. But what really makes a Thanksgiving meal over the top and just the perfect, perfect meal is when you can finish it off with a little bit of pumpkin pie and ice cream. Some people might throw apple pie in there um but there is that special player in your fantasy lineup that's the dessert that it's gonna just make your week make that dinner just complete and get you that thanksgiving victory at the end it's really simple here it's got to be the back three players yeah i i gotta agree with you there there's only one thing you know you finish the thing you finish the turkey you finish the mashed potatoes you have the stuffing you have the dinner rolls yeah you're full but you're not sit on the couch. I got to fall asleep and I can't stand up for the next four hours full. Uh, uh, uh. But you know what does get you there? You know what does is when you see 
Nate Oxberger, <laughs> Joe Mono, those guys, Caleb McInerney. You see those guys come in, give you a 20-point performance, and that pumpkin pie is just coming right in your stomach, and then all of a sudden you're sitting on the couch and you're comatose because you cannot move. Comatose with fantasy points. Yeah, and I and, agree, and you can Ryan. never have enough. You can never have enough pumpkin pie. You might have had the yeah. most turkey and the and the most stuffing and all the mashed potatoes, but you can well, always go for that second slice of pumpkin here's, pie. Here's and when that's you can't, what those back three players are doing for you. But here's when you can't have enough, Fry. When it ain't good. No, that's true. That pumpkin pie stinks. And it's the you're biggest not going letdown. for a second slice. You're all probably questioning finishing the first slice, um, and you're sitting there unhappy unfinished uh you feel like something's missing and when your fantasy lineup has a dud in the in the back three position you definitely feel like you left something on the table yeah it's probably the most depressing i mean you're looking forward to it you're looking forward to that big time performance you're looking forward to that pumpkin pie all yeah. meal long and then for it to not be good for them to not put up that big performance to get you that fantasy mlr win probably the most, most disappointing out of the bunch but anyways yeah. to summarize it we got the turkey we got our centers and back rowers that's the staple of it you got the cranberry sauce and our kickers got the stuffing could be your scrum half or front row mashed potatoes throw them in a bunch there sometimes you mix the scrum the mashed potatoes and the stuffing together so mm -hmm. you can kind of put it there uh you got your dinner rolls um and you're lucky if you got your sam gala dinner roll and then you got the pumpkin pie to finish it off with the back three players um man it's making me hungry i'm looking forward to this thanksgiving should be good matt you're coming up uh here to pennsylvania with the fam to enjoy um we got to admit we're not having a turkey we're going ham this year it was kind of to our sentiment getting a little bit tired of turkey so turkey ham uh it's going to be a good one this weekend yeah and mashed potatoes over baked don't question me on it that's just it is what it is you always get the mash all right. Well, hey, happy Thanksgiving to all of our American friends who are listening and watching. Um, enjoy the time with your 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 holiday. Uh, enjoy the time in the holidays. Enjoy the time with your family. Matt, I'll finish off on this. What, what are you most thankful for heading into this uh, Thanksgiving weekend? Well, you know, I'm going to say I'm most thankful for Vandy. Because <laughs> even though Vandy doesn't show up and isn't <laughs> able to show up for these shows, I know that he's looking over our shoulders and just providing the support that we need. He makes me feel better about my fantasy skills. Um, and he's always there to do that, whether it's fantasy rugby, whether it's fantasy football, um, or any other fantasy sports. His inability makes me feel like I have an ability and I'm thankful for that. So thank you, Vandy. That's a beautiful thing. And, and so much so that you've copied him with the mustache here too. Yes. So uh, not to mention that uh, for me, Hey, I got to be thankful for the rise of fantasy MLR and I'm looking there forward to what's going to be coming and in less than uh, a year's time here. Um, I cannot, I cannot wait. Thankful for all the people again that have made this possible. Thankful for the people, our league members uh, that have uh, been our test dummies for the course of the past couple of years. Thankful for our uh, website guru, uh, 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 Alistair Kirschpool, who has been working with me so closely to get that done. Thankful for our viewers. Thankful for our listeners. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can keep this on going and expand this again. Like we said at the top of the show to everyone out there to experience fantasy mlr so hopefully we'll be able to do that taking a break this holiday weekend from the show so we'll see you in two weeks again have a great thanksgiving to all of our american listeners and uh yeah enjoy the time with your families thankful for you all thank you vandy you've been listening to the fantasy ruckers show bringing fantasy rugby to the masses covering everything rugby from the mlr and beyond we hope you enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and be sure to tell all your friends. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, connect with us on social media at The Fantasy Ruckers. Till next time, this is The Fantasy Ruckers Show, signing off.